This happened to me a few years back. They call me an urban explorer. You know, break into abandoned buildings, snap some photos, get chased out by security if someone gets wind you're there. No big deal. A bit of danger, a bit of excitement. Nothing really dangerous. Mostly, these things happen off the beaten track old factories, hospitals. The sort of places everyone forgets about when the last worker gets laid off. Then they rot until someone with a YouTube channel sees dollar signs. That's how I find most of them. Then there's that trip to Maine, an old asylum, way out in the sticks. My buddy Vincent swore the place was haunted. Real cliché stuff. Me, I figured a couple of beers, a couple of spooky pics. We'd leave with a good story. That's all it ever was. Turns out I was dead wrong. The moment we step over the broken down fence, Vincent points. Fresh tire tracks near the back loading dock. We check them out, big truck or van. Maybe another crew here for the photos, but no cars in the lot. We enter this old rusted fire escape leading up to the second floor. It creaks under my boots, echoes carrying who knows how far. Inside, it's the classic horror trope. Peeling paint, shattered glass, and rooms left like somebody had run screaming decades ago. Vincent takes off like a bloodhound looking for ghosts. I try to get a few decent shots under the fading natural light. There's this long corridor with flickering fluorescent bulbs. Every few steps another shadow seems to dart away. A trick of the mind, sure, but it puts me on edge. Maybe there was someone else. An animal. Or another explorer who spooked us with the truck outside. I call out to Vincent, but no answer. And that's when the noises start. Not voices, not animal cries. Like scratching, then banging coming from the far end of the hall. And a smell, metallic and old. A sickly sweet rot I had never experienced before. Then, a shadow that moved. Wrong. No way it was human. Tall, hunched, dragging what looked like a length of chain along the grimy floor. I freeze, heart pounding fit to burst through my chest. Then I turn and bolt. Corridors fly by and there's still silence outside of my panicking breaths. Then I break out into this big storage space, crates lined up against the wall. A heavy thud makes me spin around. The figure blocks the way out, blocking the sunlight. A twisted form I won't ever forget. Pale skin, blood running in streaks down its chest, teeth filed into jagged edges. Vincent's phone lay just in front of it, cracked as if dropped from a height. Its eyes find mine, hungry and bright. My name's Idris. That day, I lost Vincent. I'm no cop. I can't say for sure he's dead. But his social media went quiet. Never another mention of this haunted asylum. His family? Well, they just think he disappeared. There was nobody to look for answers after I ran. No police report, because what would I have told them? That a monster came out of the dark and I escaped by the skin of my teeth? Now, my phone's full of half-deleted photos of abandoned houses, farms, hospitals. They're a taunting reminder that any one of them might hold another hungry shape lurking in the dark. My hobby used to be fun. Now, every shadow makes me jump. My friends think I've gone crazy. Maybe I have. This happened to me a few years back. Was fresh out of college back then, doing that whole van life thing. Seemed like the answer to my problems when student debt hits like a truck, you know. Figured, live simply, explore, finally do some decent photography without paying big city rent. Call me Emery. Ended up rambling all across the U.S. Southwest. Got into the rhythm of it. Stop in national parks to make some cash selling prints to tourists. Then head off grid between jobs. Found this sweet spot up in Utah. Bryce Canyon National Park area. Those hoodoos. Man, nothing prepares you for seeing them firsthand. Figured I'd kick back, find some good vantage points, get a killer photography portfolio going. First night there, everything seemed peaceful. I'd parked outside an RV campground, keeping it low-key. But when the campground went dark, I'll admit, that feeling of total isolation hit. Had this thought flashed through my head, what if something happens out here and nobody even knows you exist? Stupid, right? Still, that night, I didn't sleep great. Dreams felt all jumbled up, almost fevered. But I chalked it up to being someplace new. Next morning, woke up to see this piece of paper under my windshield wiper. 
Didn't have anything official written on it, just a scrawled note in messy handwriting. Need permits for overnight parking. That got me annoyed. BLM land. Who the hell was patrolling around here? Didn't see any signs when I pulled in. Was about to toss it, and that's when I noticed something behind my van. Footprints. Human footprints. Now this freaked me out a bit. Figured a ranger saw me parked, left the warning, no big deal, right? Except, those footprints led further out into the scrubland, not back towards any road. Whoever it was watched me sleep, then walked on away. That day, couldn't relax. Took photos, but every time I heard a twig snap or sensed movement out of the corner of my eye, I froze. Night comes, my nerves were shot. Didn't want to hunker down inside the van with nobody nearby. I figured higher ground, more visibility, safer. Hiked up towards a ridge, found a flat spot offering a 360-degree view. Laid out my sleeping bag, told myself that I could keep tabs on anything coming close. But the feeling stuck with me. You ever get the sense you're being watched and there's just... nothing there? That was this weird sensation I couldn't shake. Tried to joke to myself, calling out into the darkness. All right, come on out, who wants my parking fee? But my voice cracked. Maybe adrenaline, maybe panic, but somewhere close to midnight, I couldn't sleep. Finally gave in, got up, and figured I'd try to snap some star photos. And, swear to God, as I'm setting up my tripod, I see him. He stands on a distant mesa, silhouetted against the starlight. I can't quite make out his form, but he's standing tall, completely still, watching. Doesn't move as I scramble backward, grabbing for my backpack. Something catches my eye again, something gleaming at my original campsite. My van window is smashed in. Everything I have, ripped through. But whoever did it, he isn't there. No, that's just a distraction. He's got my attention. That whole night turned into a desperate hike, me stumbling toward the campground lights, guided more by fear than good sense. Didn't care about footprints, noise, nothing mattered except getting back to other people, back to cell service. Hitched a ride to the nearest town the next morning, called the cops. But when they got to my van, all that was there were ransacked belongings, shattered glass, and the desert stretching out into nothing. When I try to recall it now, even I doubt the bits I saw. It's easy to write off as an animal on the ridge, my mind jumping at shadows after being alone for so long. Still, a couple of details won't budge. The footprints near the van, too large, too human to be explained away. That night hike, though blurry with panic, there's this image ingrained in my head of that figure on the mesa. Taller than most men, and when he moved, wrong. I've seen all sorts of folks who live off-grid, and trust me, there was something different about him. After that, I went back to the city grind for a while. Sometimes, still get an urge to hit the road, explore those wide-open spaces. But I also think, what if someone or some thing saw me out there on my own, thought I looked easy. I never park by myself anymore, and those days on BLM land where I'm the only soul around. You bet I check behind my back more than I probably should. This happened to me a couple years back. Can't even look at an RV now without wanting to puke. My name's Everett. Back then, me and my wife Nora, well... Things got kind of rocky. Thought this could fix it, you know? Grand road trip. Quality time. Stupid idea. Worst part is, the start went exactly as planned. Everett and Nora had chosen to camp up along the Oregon coast. We rented the classic camper van. Figured it'd be easy enough to find spots without having to book campgrounds too far in advance. That sense of freedom. It did help get our heads clearer for a while. Then that little town came rolling along. Gold Beach, maybe you've heard of it. Quaint little place, seemed all sunshine and smiles and tourists. Even found a spot with a great view of the ocean, just pulled off on some empty back road right along the cliffside. That was our first mistake. Night came, beautiful sunset, perfect weather. All set up with some barbecue, wine, the whole deal. Then, I went down the slope near the cliff to relieve myself. Saw it in the twilight. Looked like trash at first, some white plastic caught in the rocks by the shore. Then it moved. Got a better look and realized it was a person. 
Now here's where things go wrong. Did I investigate? Nope. Did I go back, tell my wife, find somewhere populated to park? Nada. My mind jumped right to don't need the hassle. We weren't in danger. Dude was stuck down there. Figured a hiker fell, probably injured. Someone would surely check it out in the morning, get those emergency crews or whatever. Went back to our romantic campfire like nothing happened. Even cracked a joke. You wouldn't believe it, babe. There's some litter bug right down there. Something like that. Nora laughed. My gut was twisting, though. The whole night, even though we barely got any sleep because of the waves, part of me kept straining to hear someone yell for help from below. Finally, sunrise hit. Took a proper look out. Nothing. No person. No plastic bag. Not a damn thing. Even went ahead and scrambled down. Figured maybe the tide took whatever it was. There wasn't even a place a human could have survived to fall down there. Just jagged rocks and cold salt water. That's where the trip fell apart for good. Nora thought I was nuts. Maybe stress made me hallucinate. Maybe it did. Either way, this tension crept in. A whisper of bad luck just waiting to get louder. Then came the car trouble. Just outside town, on some winding forest road, middle of nowhere, the camper van's engine just died. Couldn't restart for the life of me. Had to call a tow truck. Guy didn't roll around until the next afternoon. Took one look under the hood, swore, and explained about some busted part the local shop won't even have in stock for days. Nora and I just drifted apart after that. Got stuck in a motel right along the highway, nothing to do but wait and fight. Turns out sharing a space that tiny gets old real fast. On the third night, it got heated, yelling, insults, all of it. Took a walk to cool off, found myself just down by the main road. No idea where I was going till I looked up and saw those motel room lights reflected in the windows of a parked station wagon. It sat across the highway, pointed dead at our room. Figured I'd left something inside, walked closer. That's when I saw him. The silhouette huddled there, framed in that window. Tall, lanky, skin shining pale in the headlights of passing cars. Couldn't make out any other details, but I didn't want to. Turned, got away as fast as possible. Back at the motel, didn't sleep at all. Just sat at the back window, waiting, listening. That shape across the road was still there in the morning, parked as though they hadn't moved an inch all night. We got out of there on that tow truck as soon as the part arrived. Nora barely spoke to me for weeks. Eventually, after more fights and too much silence, we split for good. Maybe we would have anyway. Maybe that camper van was just the catalyst. All I know is, if I hadn't looked away from that guy on the beach, if I hadn't assumed things were simpler than they seemed, maybe he wouldn't have followed us. Because I saw him again after, you know, sometimes in a crowd, a glimpse of someone tall and too thin in the wrong shadows. Sometimes in the rearview mirror on a dark, empty road. No idea what that thing was or what it even wanted. Some primal wrongness the cliff spat up when I wasn't looking, I suppose. The ocean keeps its secrets, that's what the postcards say. Maybe better it stayed that way. This happened a few years ago. It was supposed to be the ultimate road trip. Me, Ezra, and a beat-up old camper van we scored cheap. Ezra and I have been buddies since middle school, always dreaming of hitting the open road after finishing college. But sometimes, life's funny when it kicks your expectations down a dirt track into oblivion. We rolled through Idaho, aiming for those big sky, empty spaces, you know the type. Pulled off toward Sawtooth National Forest, drawn by the jagged mountain views and promise of quiet woods. Found a spot right near a bubbling creek, not another soul in sight. Paradise at first glance. Only a few hours in, I should have noticed the silence of the place. No birds, no breeze, rustling leaves, just... stillness. Looking back, that should have been the first red flag. But when you're young and thinking yourself invincible, sometimes intuition whispers when it should damn well yell. After sunset, Ezra wanted to crack open a few beers around the fire. Standard camping stuff. It's funny now, I guess, to think it all started so casual. I noticed a half-buried rock near the fire pit, and curiosity, always been my downfall, 
got the better of me. Started digging and unearthed what looked like a rusty old trap kind used for fur back in the pioneer days. Creepy, yeah, but something about it felt different. Showed it to Ezra, but he couldn't have cared less. Busy regaling me with some epic city escape tale as usual. I kept fiddling with the thing, a compulsion building up inside me. Ezra called me obsessed, laughing. We had that typical back and forth thing going on. Maybe he was right, but hey, a bit of an explorer spirit never hurt anyone. Or so I thought. He eventually drifted off, and the dying fire left just those dancing shadows creeping along the edge of our clearing. You ever sit alone near a wilderness campfire at night? It's something eerie about it, something primal. Something in that old trap started rattling like clockwork in my hands. And that's when I heard the footsteps snap a twig somewhere deep in the woods. Ezra slept on, no clue that every nerve in my body screamed danger. It came again, crunch of heavy boots. Panic flared up mixed with cold, logical calculation. The RV was my one shot at escape. Lunged for it, fumbling with the door. Too slow. A massive hand closed over my shoulder, wrenching me backward. He was tall, gaunt, like he'd spent his life bent beneath the weight of too hard labor. Old minor clothes hung loose on his frame, worn face hidden in shadow. Had that wildness some men get when they live too far from anything resembling society. An axe hung slack in his other hand, moonlight catching the chipped steel. Then a whisper, raspy like he hadn't spoken in years. This my land. What's mine is mine. Terror cut my breathing short, but with it came a burst of desperate rage. Elbow smashed back into his ribs, forcing a surprised grunt out of him. That flicker of weakness was all I needed. Dove and rolled broke free into the trees, ran like the devil was on my tail, which, honestly, wasn't that far off the mark. Trees blurred together, heart trying to hammer out of my chest. He didn't yell, didn't speak, nothing but the steady crunch of those damn footsteps keeping pace, like a predator toying with its prey. Finally, my path veered into thick undergrowth near the creek. That's when I stumbled on them. Campers, couple in their mid-forties, judging by the fancy gear. Should have felt some relief, the first sign of normal folks in hours. Instead, just more horror. They lay side by side in their sleeping bags, throats gaping in ragged slashes. My stomach heaved. No blood. None at all. That madman must have drained them to lessen the mess. It's an image carved into my soul even now. He knew their screams wouldn't carry this far, had this whole ritual perfected. Back into those suffocating woods I ran. Every snapped twig sounded like gunfire. Every flicker of firelight was him closing in. I finally came out by a logging road where, by some crazy luck, two college kids on a late-night drive spotted me. Wild-eyed, covered in scratches. You can imagine the story I threw at them. Back at the ranger station, the police weren't fully buying it. Small-town cops always seemed skeptical of outsiders. The bodies they did find, couple, axe wounds, looked too clean-cut, no sign of some unhinged mountain man lurking about. The old trap thing just got tossed. The RV was empty, no Ezra. That was the worst part. They looked at me, some unspoken doubt in their eyes. Never went back for what they couldn't find, and never saw his face, just that shadowed outline beneath a faded ball cap. Some nights I think I might have just dreamt it. Then the phantom ache settles into my shoulder where his grip dug in, and I know damn well it was real. The others got graves at least. Ezra? Out there somewhere? Maybe the ground swallowed his bones for good. And somewhere amongst those trees, that madman is living off whatever sick rituals he's built in the silence. Sometimes a little adventure is way more than you bargained for, or survived. This happened to me a few years back. Makes me chuckle now, not because of what happened, that still sends shivers down my spine, but because of what a skeptical idiot I was before it. See, I've always prided myself on being practical, down to earth, someone who isn't swayed by ghost stories and creepy campfire tales. Funny how life knocks that arrogance right out of you. My name's Derek, by the way. 
mid-30s, outdoorsy-ish, more a hiking enthusiast than a full-blown survivalist. Back then, I was into this kick of trying RV life after seeing all those folks gushing about it online. Figured it would be a neat way to work remotely and see some different national parks. So there I was, driving along a scenic state highway in Arizona. Can't say the exact place. Wouldn't want you folks running off getting yourselves into the same mess I did. It was beautiful country, though. Those red rock formations rising out of the desert. The whole Wild West vibe. I'd found a quiet little pull-off with stunning views. Just me in the wilderness. Paradise, as far as I was concerned. That first evening, nothing weird. I cracked open a beer, grilled some dinner, relaxed at the little RV's table. You know those travel brochures that go on about endless starry nights? I was living that cliché, and loving every damn second. I stayed up late, staring out, letting the silence and solitude settle over me. This kind of peace. You only get it way out from civilization. Maybe that's the first mistake I made. Believing I was truly alone. Next morning I woke up, made coffee, the whole cozy RV routine. I decided to do a short hike before getting down to work. There was a trail winding up from the highway, and the view promised to be even better than from the campground. Off I sat, feeling adventurous, my backpack light. About half a mile up, things took a bizarre turn. There it was, smack in the middle of the path, a pile of coyote bones. Now, animals die. It's nature. But this, it was meticulously arranged. Ribs all lined up, the skull staring off down the trail like a little skeletal guardian. No bite marks, no sign of a struggle. It looked like they had just collapsed into this perfect, creepy display. My city slicker mind balked. Maybe some weird kid did this, I mumbled to myself, poking it with my hiking stick. That felt off. I was in the wilderness, middle of nowhere, and someone's bored child is out here building horror movie props. Didn't add up. But determined not to let this ruin my hike, I pushed it out of mind and moved on. Hours later, back at the RV, I still couldn't shake it. Every crack of a twig, every rustle had me on edge. Was someone watching me? It was stupid, that primal sense of unease, but it wouldn't let go. That night, sleep was restless. Every shadow danced with menace, every whisper of wind carried some imagined threat, and I started hearing something else, faint, distant scratching, coming from outside. I froze. It sounded like nails on the RV door. Just as the sound was fading, I gathered the courage to peek out a window. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Nerves getting the better of you, Derek. I snorted at myself, but the adrenaline wouldn't go away. It wasn't like there were bears this far south, but you hear horror stories. People alone in the woods, never being seen again. What if this was it? This quiet spot would be the perfect place to get rid of some nosy arver and no one would have a clue until my rig got found years later. By morning, I was laughing at myself. Of course, there wasn't anyone waiting to eat me. Had to be wind on the branches. Whatever. Yet something had changed. Every noise set me on high alert. I was no longer out for a relaxing getaway. I was in survival mode. That instinct probably saved my life. This happened to me a few years ago. Looking back, the whole thing seems ridiculous. The type of tale you brush off with a nervous laugh in company. Of course, at the time, it was far from laughable. I'm a city guy, born and bred. The idea of getting close to nature fills me with an odd mix of anxiety and boredom. That said, my cousin Joel talks a good game when it comes to the beauty of the real America. And, well, my wife Karen, bless her, wanted to make him happy. It was his fortieth, after all. Thus, in what can only be described as a lapse of judgment, I found myself wedged into an oversized RV, heading through the vast open spaces of the Nevada desert. Not my scene at all. Now Joel, he was like a kid at Christmas. My aunt and uncle even chipped in. They rented the thing specifically because he's never been out of the city before, except for one time visiting Grandma. Bless their hearts. First couple of days weren't so bad. Mostly driving. There's not much to do inside one of those glorified buses but eat and sleep. I felt bad for Karen. 
She got stuck navigating these little back roads while the rest of us chilled out. Finally, we got close to Joel's dream destination, a place called Red Rock Canyon. He couldn't stop talking about the formations, the hikes. Honestly, it all sounded like different shades of brown to me. But hey, keeps him smiling. We picked a spot just off the trail, a real remote kind of place. Sun's low in the sky, casts long shadows on the boulders. It's quiet, peaceful almost. Then my aunt notices. The tires slashed. We check them all, and another's been cut clean down the side. At this point, doubt sinks in. It couldn't be an accident. We're stranded miles from civilization on purpose. My stomach knots up. We gotta get help, I insist. I look to Joel, Karen. There's fear in their eyes, too. But there's no cell service. Not surprising out here, of course, but a punch in the gut, nonetheless. Night rolls in faster than you'd think in the desert. We rig up with flashlights, but darkness in a place like that. There's a type of heaviness to it. Every rustle in the brush makes me jump. Karen stays tight by my side. You feel vulnerable. Exposed. I swear I hear voices out there, low whispers on the wind, carrying on the night air. But whenever we chase the sound, nothing. My mind works overtime, conjuring up images of some backwoods lunatic stalking us. Maybe it's just the stress playing with my head. That's when the rock hits the RV. A solid thump echoes through the metal shell. Then another, and another. We huddle together, unsure what to do. It stops as suddenly as it started. Joel cracks a worried joke, trying to lighten the mood. Guess someone wanted our parking spot. Doesn't quite land. That night, none of us sleeps easily. Every little creak and groan feels like someone circling, closing in. I know. It sounds pathetic, but you try being there and see how calm you stay. Morning light brings no relief, only rising dread. It's decided. We'll try to hike out. We pack essentials, water mostly, and leave a note under the windshield. I explain the tires, tell whoever finds it we left on foot for the nearest town. We'd rather take our chances walking than stay there another night. Trail winds between giant sandstone formations, like colossal red teeth flanking the path. With every turn I keep glancing over my shoulder, expecting to see... I don't even know what I expect to see. Maybe a figure lurking just out of sight? I find myself checking my watch, even though time has practically vanished in my internal clock of fear. We push on, step by step. No talking, just the sound of boots on rough earth. It's strange how even with company, I've never felt more alone. The sun bears down, the dry heat like a furnace blast with every gust of wind. We're not made for this kind of walking. I can see it in the others, in the slump of their shoulders, the slowing pace. My legs burn. There's something about being this exposed, under a sky this wide dot 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 IT makes you feel insignificant. And then another flash of panic. Ahead, on the trail, a dark stain. Not the red of the rocks, something deeper and wet. We get closer and gasp in unison. There lies a bird, wings splayed at awkward angles, feathers matted with a thick crimson smear. I kneel down, the blood still sticky. Something killed this, and not long ago. Fear surges through me, a real primal response. My aunt starts sobbing a mix of despair and terror. My voice gets rough as I command we turn back. Joel fights me on it for a moment, his stubbornness flaring up. They probably took pity, he tries to sound positive, slashed the tires so we wouldn't wander and then left when they realized. His sentence trails off, none of us buy it. There's malice in the act, I recognize it instinctively. This wasn't some misguided help. We retreat to the RV, hearts pounding. Back to square one. A few more sleepless hours pass, and again the stones start hitting the metal. The pattern keeps up, relentless. I try to focus on the breathing of the others, to calm my ragged nerves. Then it changes. There's a scraping sound now, something dragging itself along the side. Karen whimpers beside me, and I pull her close protectively. The noise persists, the scraping now interspersed with heavy, irregular thumps against the vehicle. Every bump makes the RV rock slightly, my imagination running wild. My heart thunders in my chest, and that's when I see it. 
Through the dusty window, there's a form outside. In the pale moonlight, a silhouette hulks by the door. Its shoulders are too broad, arms too long, and I could swear the head doesn't sit quite right. The way it moves isn't natural. A lurching, uneven gait. I can't make out details, but I know instinctively this isn't something natural. Isn't some regular person wandering alone at night. The thing pauses, and it feels like my soul freezes in my chest. But then... It shuffles away, back into the night. There's a sound like claws dragging against metal as it moves, sending waves of dread through me. The sun's only a few hours off now, but we won't last until then. The thing, whatever it is, it comes back every night. It's playing with us. My mind runs in circles through impossible escape plans while simultaneously telling me we're doomed, that it's only a matter of time, that this night might well be our last. Dawn arrives in a smear of sickly gray. In those thin streaks of light, something shifts in me. I find a spark of determination, born from raw desperation. It can't end like this. There are some tools under the driver's seat. Basic stuff, not much we can make use of. One thing does catch my eye, though. A hefty lug wrench. If that thing comes close again, at least I have something more than my bare hands. I tuck it discreetly at my side and force myself to think to plan. It's the only way I can stop my nerves from unraveling completely. By daylight, my aunt and uncle have given in to pure exhaustion. It feels heartless, but this gives me more room to work. It would be impossible to shield them while simultaneously confronting the, well, whatever it is lurking out there. That thought still shivers down my spine, even in the light of day. I tell them to make themselves as small as possible behind the seats. Stay under cover where they can't be seen through the windows. They obey with silent understanding, their eyes wide with terror-filled compliance. Karen squeezes my hand, her skin clammy. Just the touch brings a flicker of strength back. For her, we wouldn't give up without a fight. There's a cooler we managed to jam under the dashboard. I wrench it out. Inside are just a few melted snacks and warm water bottles. I take one and unscrew the lid. There's no grand plan here, just pure instinct. This water is our ammunition. Now for the hardest part, waiting. Time crawls. Even with the engine off, the desert heat bakes through the metal. Every minute drags like an hour. Every rustling shadow at the window makes my stomach clench. But somehow, the hours slip by without our nocturnal stalker returning. I realize it knows night is its time to play its cruel games. The light... Even this weak daylight offers some sort of protection. My nerves remain at full battle readiness, but a cautious flicker of hope burns beneath them. Sunset looms, casting long, jagged shadows across the rocks. My body goes rigid. With the dwindling light comes the realization, time's running out. The waiting for it might end up worse than the thing itself. Joel stirs from his exhausted slumber with a confused groan. Don't, I warn him finger to my lips. The tension snaps around us like a live wire. I feel them behind me, eyes wide with that familiar mix of fear and confusion, all unspoken questions hanging thick in the hot, stale air of the RV. My hand tightens around the lug wrench. And then, there it is. The scrape of claws, the lurching silhouette appearing out of the deepening dusk. This time it lingers by the driver's side window, peering directly in. I can't make out any features, just that sense of something horribly wrong, like a twisted distortion of a person. There's a hungry intentness there, something chillingly deliberate. That's the moment I break, not in fear, but in pure, unbridled rage. With a primal yell, I launch myself forward, smashing open the door. I raise the wrench, ready to defend my family, myself, whatever, even if it's a futile, suicidal act. But whatever intelligence exists in those shadowy eyes must recognize the shift, the desperate determination I hold. For a terrifyingly long moment we stare each other down. It's like a duel with unimaginable stakes. In that moment, there's the flash of the water bottle against the backdrop of the darkening sky. An act born of instinct rather than reason. The splash makes it flinch, and even in the gloom I see whatever skin I hit redden as if burned. Its lanky frame twists back, then melts into the night. Its retreat brings no satisfaction, 
No real sense of victory, just bone-deep relief. My body sags against the RV, and there's a shaking I can't control. We survived another night. We wait until the first tentative streaks of dawn before daring to move. Joel takes over the wheel. I won't lie, my hands don't quite work right. It feels like another lifetime back on those smooth paved roads. There's no cell service, but at least there are other cars. Normal cars. Just seeing them feels like a lifeline. With luck, it wouldn't be too long before we are in eyesight of some semblance of civilization. It might just be our lifeline after all. We flag down a pickup truck, an older couple staring down curiously at our slashed tires. My story sounds insane, even as I'm saying it. The looks they exchange. I get it. I expect skepticism, a hint of amused accusation. Instead, their faces go pale, and there's a flicker of recognition in their eyes. Fear and maybe a trace of pity. I want to demand answers, but they won't meet my stare. We exchange contact information just in case, then they're hurrying back to their car, casting fleeting glances towards the fading desert horizon. There are hushed whispers about local stories as we roll into a quiet town, tales passed down, rumors about things glimpsed in the shadows out there. We get checked out at a clinic, treated for dehydration, mild shock, there are police reports, of course, and lots of unanswered questions. They look at us with a mix of skepticism and disbelief, like we're either lying or have lost our minds. I never saw the thing again. I won't pretend I believe my water bottle stunt chased it back to whatever lair it crawls in and out of. There's something out there in those empty spaces, in the margins of light and darkness. You wouldn't catch me willingly getting that close to finding out again. We stayed the night at a generic motel, clinging to the artificial hum of the lights like it was our sanctuary. There are whispers still. From that couple in the truck, from locals we ran into at the diner. Stories told in hushed tones about things out there in those vast, lonely landscapes. You're called dramatic, told you saw nothing, and maybe you start to doubt the experience yourself in the harsh clarity of day. But in those still, sleepless nights, the memory of that silhouette against the rising moon burns so vividly that even I start to question what is real and what's a trick of the night. But one thing I know with absolute certainty, there's no amount of city lights bright enough to erase that primal flicker of terror. The lingering sensation of being something out there in the desert darkness had us marked for its prey. This happened to me a few years back. Reckoning it up now, it feels even more surreal, like a half-remembered fever dream. I'm Kaisen, not exactly what you'd call the outdoorsy type, but you get stir-crazy working as a web designer, staring at a glowing screen in your tiny apartment all day. One weekend, an old buddy extended an invite out to his family's secluded cabin up in the Olympic National Forest. Sounded like the perfect escape. Now, my buddy Kale has always been... A bit peculiar. He's the kind of guy who has his finger on the pulse of the latest conspiracy theory or outlandish internet forum before anyone. The trip up was pretty uneventful. Miles of old-growth forests and winding logging roads. Kale chatted non-stop about strange disappearances reported in the area, something about missing hikers never being found. I tried to humor him. You need patience with that sort of thing when it comes to Kale. After we arrived at the cabin, however, it became harder to be so dismissive. This wasn't the cozy forest hideaway I had imagined. The place had a real sense of unease to it. Walls covered in old news clippings and maps marked up with cryptic symbols, rambling journal entries, faded Polaroid photos. I tried to piece it together. It seemed he was fixated on some local urban legend. Kale swore there was a connection between the old tales the indigenous people used to tell, recent disappearances and whatever dark secret he felt had settled over the area. That first evening, after a bit too much cheap beer and Kale's campfire ramblings, something weird happened. I'd woken up around two in the morning. The crackling of the dying fire and a strange humming noise made me step outside. I assumed it was the wind, but it sounded almost melodic. Now here's where things get blurry. It's like that moment just before a sudden jolt wakes you fully from a deep sleep. Part of me knew it wasn't right, that whatever produced that hypnotic drone wasn't natural. Then the clearing came into view, and that's when my memory falters. I know I saw something, 
A flash of... of what? I cannot comprehend. It was all over in a flash. In fact, as the morning came and Kale tried to excitedly pick apart what little I claimed to remember, I started to believe I'd hallucinated the whole thing. Later on, we decided to take his rusty ATV into the woods to explore, to get a break from all the intensity back at the cabin. That's when we found it. An old hunter's shack, hidden deep amongst the trees. I felt a cold tingle down my spine. My nightmare from the night before seemed to play out right before my eyes. The place showed unmistakable signs of a struggle. Furniture was smashed, clothes strewn around, and dried blood splatters. Something violent had happened here. It wasn't an animal. They're less messy. We called it in. That was as involved as I wanted to be. As I headed back to my apartment a few days later, an unmarked vehicle approached Kale's place before I could leave. Men in suits got out, looking grim. It seemed a couple of hikers had gone missing near where we discovered the shack. It gave me chills because, well, let's just say there were too many weird coincidences stacking up for comfort. Kale, ever eager for vindication, rushed toward the men, shouting something about conspiracies and evidence to back his claims up. They brushed him off, ignoring his desperate pleas. His demeanor shifted quickly as they drove away. Instead of his usual wild-eyed mania, I saw genuine horror reflected in his face. That scared me more than anything else so far. He turned back toward me before going inside, but all he said was a whispered, Don't go back. It seemed less like a buddy's warning and more like a terrified plea. A day later, the police were asking questions about Kale. Not because of the men in the unmarked car, but because he'd also disappeared. I still wonder, was he in danger? Maybe he figured something out, some chilling truth he couldn't live with. Or, the darker part of me whispers, had he become part of whatever shadowed those woods? In all honesty, I couldn't sleep in my apartment for months. It started to feel too suffocating, like eyes were always peering in through the windows. Sometimes at night, I catch a hint of that same low, almost rhythmic drone I heard near the cabin. Maybe it's just distant traffic, but the way it stirs that sick panic in the pit of my stomach, it reminds me that those deep woods hide things humans have no place understanding. It reminds me that there are always some questions better left unanswered. This happened to me a couple of years back. Now, here's the thing about me, Thad, by the way. I'm one of those preparedness guys. Self-sufficiency, living off the land, not full-on doomsday cult. But hey, a little planning never hurt anyone. That's how I found myself out in the wilderness, far-flung corner of the Olympic National Forest, testing my skills with a minimalist camping setup. I figured what better proving ground than those ancient mountains and rugged landscapes, right? It started well enough. First night, I managed to snag a couple of trout from a stream and made a passable fire without too much trouble. Sure, there were some sounds at night, branches breaking, the distant call of some animal I didn't recognize. But hey, you expect that in the woods. The real trouble began on the second day. That's when I stumbled onto the signs of another camp. Not an official site with marked trails, but deeper in. There was evidence of someone, an old campfire, half-hidden shelters built from deadfall, and a lot of stripped bones littering the ground. They seemed old. No scavengers had messed with them. My survivalist brain switched into high gear. The setup didn't seem temporary. Something had been living there for a hell of a long time. This wasn't just another camper. A wave of unease swept over me. There's the wilderness you expect, and the kind that feels... wrong. Back at my own meager camp, I tried to convince myself that perhaps it was a poacher hideout or something equally explainable. But with every rustling wind in the trees, every snap of a twig echoing eerily through the valley, that gut feeling intensified. I'd stumbled onto someone's territory. By morning, any attempt at rationalization had fizzled away. All my senses were in overdrive, that instinctive part of my brain kicking in and shouting that someone or something was watching me from the dark edges of the trees. When I saw a crude spear jammed into the earth near my meager campfire, it was a breaking point. No note, no threat. Just a clear mark that I'd been discovered. 
With trembling hands, I packed up what little gear I had, a knot of dread growing in my stomach. As I hiked out, there was this persistent prickling sensation at the back of my neck. Not once did I ever see him, though that didn't mean he wasn't there. It would have been easier to write myself off as crazy, overreacting to some strange hiker or recluse messing with me. But that gnawing terror was like nothing I'd ever felt. Then, as I approached a road, I saw it. The body of an animal, mangled and barely recognizable, and not by any predator I knew. Then the smell of it, acrid and coppery, the stink of iron clinging to the air. That's when I knew the stories whispered of that area might not be mere local lore after all. The locals mentioned disappearances, the odd hunter or hiker simply vanishing. That feeling in the deepest shadows of those forests didn't feel human. The rational side of me wants to think that maybe, just maybe, these disappearances were the acts of a disturbed individual pushed too far living in isolation. But I was there. I felt that presence, that unnatural weight hanging in the air. No human is made for that type of wilderness. A park ranger I encountered looked startled by my disheveled, sweaty appearance as I emerged from the tree line. When I asked about recent disappearances, a strange look flashed across his weathered face for a heartbeat, before he told me it was nothing to worry about, son, that these woods had always been unforgiving. Later, after a shower and a night in a cheap motel, I tried to search for news reports, anything that matched what I'd seen. Not a trace. I considered returning, perhaps with a camera, or better yet, some company. The smarter man in me knows better. There are some secrets we aren't meant to unlock. A month after the ordeal, I still couldn't completely shake that sensation I'd been stalked. Was it a hermit who resented my intrusion? Did some twisted individual take pleasure in preying on unsuspecting victims? Or was I foolish enough to venture into that isolated land just as some folks from an earlier time claimed land where old hungry things waited, their only company the bones of their unwitting sacrifices? It doesn't take monsters with claws and fangs for pure terror to take hold. The worst predators in this world wear plain clothes. Or perhaps, no clothes at all. This happened to me a couple of years back. Now here's the thing about me. I love a good adventure. Hiking, fishing, you name it. Throw in a touch of exploring some uncharted wilderness and you've sold me. That's how I found myself convincing my sister Brinley and our college friends Kellen and Theo to embark on a trek into the remote backcountry of the Olympic National Forest. They're more about beach vacations, if I'm honest. Brinley even tried to bribe me with tickets to some music festival I vaguely remember hearing about. I'm stubborn that way. My name's Flynn, by the way. Olympic is all that old-growth rainforest magic towering trees, dripping moss, ferns as big as your kitchen table. You know the type of place. That first day went better than expected. The trail took us to a quiet stream where we set up base camp. No one else in sight. After throwing up tents and cooking over a campfire, we settled in to swap stories and soak up the solitude. Now, this is where it starts to go sideways. Mid-evening, Brinley swears she heard movement coming from a stand of trees nearby. I brushed it off. Wind-blown branches, or some curious squirrels, probably. Then, Theo mentioned that while fetching water earlier, he could have sworn he saw eyes watching him from a distance. He's kind of jumpy at times, and the others gave him a hard time. Still, a flicker of unease went through me too. It wasn't fear, not just yet anyway. Maybe call it intuition, or just being in the wild and feeling small in the face of the forest. Night settled in heavy. I dreamed of dark shapes shifting on the edge of sight, just shadows playing tricks with my mind. I'm a heavy sleeper usually, but I awoke suddenly. Kellen sat wide-eyed on the edge of his tent, gesturing for me to be quiet. A rhythmic scraping sound echoed outside. Brinley began calling my name in a strained whisper from her tent. There was a figure hunched in the darkness, maybe eight feet from where we lay. All I could make out was its ragged shape against the faint moonlight. This couldn't be an animal. It was upright, moving on two legs. In its hands, in its hands, it held one of our knives. I'll never forget that chill. 
The sudden clarity that this wasn't just someone stumbling on our campsite. This was... deliberate. Theo fumbled for the bear spray on his belt, hand shaking. The creature tilted its head towards us like an alert bird. We didn't hesitate. I threw our pack of food in one direction as a distraction, the knife-wielding figure moving to pounce on it. We tore across the campsite, fumbling through underbrush, desperate for an escape route. It wasn't much of a plan, but it was all we had in that heart-pounding frenzy. Running blind in that kind of forest is madness. Every tree root seemed to reach out in the dark, every branch aimed right at your eyes. It felt like hours, but when we burst breathless onto a deserted logging road, it was an oasis in the chaos. Luck a lone hiker's truck parked next to an overgrown side trail. He was packing up after some night photography, saw us stumble out, eyes wide like spooked animals. The cops got a statement, then drove us straight to the nearest ranger station. We spent the night in those uncomfortable chairs, listening to a radio playing crackling static and trying to catch slivers of sleep. The cops looked confused as we tried to describe our strange stalker. There weren't any homeless camps around there. Nothing to even indicate why some hostile person would be out in the middle of nowhere armed with a stolen kitchen knife. They said it could have been some transient, someone unstable who drifted that way. It never clicked that this was... Well, the point where you don't go into the woods again on your own. They searched, of course, and found nothing. Now the thing that haunts me isn't that initial terrifying night. It's what came after. We discovered photos were missing from Theo's camera shots he swore he took while hiking earlier that day photos no one else remembers seeing. We didn't talk much about it. There's a point where your sense of logic battles with the terror ingrained deep in your bones. Eventually, life goes on. A few months back, the news carried a report about a hiker gone missing in the Olympics. Not all that unusual, sadly. Then they showed his photo and something inside me went cold. I'd recognize that camera around his neck anywhere. Could be nothing, a coincidence. I like to think that's it. I have to think that's it. Sometimes when walking at night, a sliver of unease sets in. Something seen out of the corner of the eye, a shadow slipping along the edges of the streetlights. It's then I remind myself it's the city now, not the dark woods. There's nothing here now, I tell myself. Nothing at all. This happened to me a few years back, during one of my regular solo ventures. See, I'm into long-distance backpacking. The more isolated, the better. It's about that push, finding some inner strength as much as it is about scenic routes. My name's Thaddeus, but everyone calls me Thad. This trip's goal, the Appalachian Trail, deep into the lush forests of northern Georgia. Had some decent weather reports, good enough to last five days or so. Now you should know my style. Less about pre-planning, more about just winging it, finding a trailhead and hitting the ground running. That spontaneity led me to this off-the-beaten-path trail deep in the heart of the Chattahoochee Forest. Not much info available online, but damn if it didn't look perfect. That first day was pretty damn exhilarating. Steep ascents, dense undergrowth. It had everything I craved. But by evening, with a decent campsite located, fatigue hit hard. You don't realize how those little moments of adrenaline stack up. One minute you're setting up the tent, the next your flashlight's beam catches this... thing. Movement maybe 200 feet away, right on the edge of the tree line. My heart kicks up a notch, big cat. That'd explain the stealth. What happens next, I still struggle to believe. It steps forward just slightly, giving me a partial profile against the dusk light. Tall, lanky definitely not a bear or anything normal. Then it just vanishes into the brush. My brain plays tricks. Shadows of branches must have done it. The sense of unease remains, but after a good night's sleep, it feels like a strange, half-remembered dream. Day two starts off strong, and that initial weirdness fades. My usual pace is faster here. Maybe that initial unease had some residual influence on my subconscious. This trail, it winds a lot, turns back on itself. My sense of direction, usually excellent, starts feeling off, but who cares when this kind of natural beauty surrounds you? I even joke out loud that if I keep walking in circles, that's just more time with these ancient trees. 
By third day in, that joke doesn't feel so funny anymore. It's subtle at first. Feeling eyes on me, an odd sense of deja vu with certain trail markers. But that nagging voice tells me it's my overactive imagination. When you do solo hikes, the mind finds weird little ways to entertain itself. Or maybe those woods get to you like that after a while. Then the clearing happened. Now there was absolutely no indication that I'd come across this spot before. This was new territory. My route was meticulously outlined for just this scenario. No way should I've arrived back here. A wide, flat space ringed by towering pines. Yet it felt so unsettlingly familiar. And at the far end, nestled right where the trail led back into the woods, was a structure. Not your run-of-the-mill hiker's shelter, something older, a simple cabin. My curiosity overpowers any lingering caution. It turns out to be unlocked. The inside has this untouched quality, yet not abandoned. There are supplies, but dusty. Old newspapers with yellowed pages litter a side table. What pulls my focus, though, is this map tacked to the peeling wall. It's ancient, detailing these very woods, but some hand-drawn markings, scribbled arrows, and notes. I feel the hairs on my neck stand on end. They trace a route that matches almost exactly my own haphazard wanderings through this dense forest. Now, alarm bells are blaring full force. This place, there's intention in that map. The cabin wasn't just discovered, it was sought out. My exit is quick, almost a scramble back into the sunlight. That familiar path unfurls into the pines, a mocking sign of normalcy compared to what lurked inside. That evening, it wasn't just the setting sun giving me an uneasy feeling. This was when I found asterisk at asterisk. That same damn lanky silhouette, stalking me just ahead, moving parallel to the trail, mirroring my every step. At least now there was clear sight of the thing, long legs almost unnaturally so with this hunched gait. Then, for a chilling moment, it turns its head slightly in my direction. That face, if you can call it that, like a smooth, featureless egg laid atop its shoulders. No eyes, no mouth nothing recognizable. Every cell in my body screamed to run, but some morbid fascination held me rooted. Then it was gone again, dissolving back into the dense undergrowth. By dawn, I'd packed camp at a speed bordering on manic. There was nowhere to go but ahead, back down the trail that had led me into this mess. But by midday, it felt like every turn brought nothing new. My footsteps echoed against the same giants I'd been passing for days. I finally broke, yelling, probably more to convince myself I wasn't just insane. At least there was an answer, sort of, an odd sound coming from up ahead, like nails against wood, only a slow, deliberate scratch. That damn cabin loomed up again. There on the dusty porch was some fresh movement, that hunched form, only something in its arms. My brain scrambled. Was it holding another person? No, the size was wrong, almost childlike. There was something shiny catching the sunlight as it swayed slightly in that creature's grip. My blood ran cold. A deer antler, and hanging just beneath, a torn scrap of blue nylon that matched the exact shade of my jacket. No question. It had caught my scent. The creature had tracked me for miles. My mind races back to that dusty map in the cabin. Was I simply its newest addition? A specimen to be tracked, hunted... Who knows what twisted fate awaited me within those walls? That's my turning point. No way I was facing whatever waited inside that cabin. Instead, there was the dense forest, and with primal determination, I dove in. Every sense was on overload, every snapping twig a predator behind me. My legs burn, lungs aching, but fear propels me faster than I've ever moved. After what feels like a lifetime... A shimmer of pale road breaks through the green gloom. Never has civilization looked so damn sweet. Stumbling to the edge of that asphalt, hitching a ride with a wide-eyed truck driver, my only words were, please, just keep driving. Now some folks have theories about backwoods cults or government experiments gone wrong. Me? I don't know what that thing was, what sick obsession drew it to that damn cabin in the woods. I just know my return route from there was deliberately vague. No one would believe me if I tried to explain the unmarked trails. There's a reason there was no trace of that place ever existing. 
Those old Appalachian woods might hide beauty, but they also hold dark secrets best left undisturbed. I still hike, but these days I choose well-charted routes, those paths less likely to turn on you when you least expect it. This happened to me a couple of years back, not sure exactly how long ago now. Time gets muddled after trauma like that. It all started with this road trip my buddy Ari and I planned, right after finishing grad school. The whole explore the country thing before real life kicked in. It was his idea to rent an RV, figured it'd be cheaper than motels. I'm more of a tent kind of guy myself, but hey, adventure, right? We ended up heading through Wyoming, drawn to the wide open landscapes and those epic national parks. Drove for what felt like ages, passing one-horse towns with quirky names and gas stations that looked straight out of the 60s. Eventually, Ari suggested we find a more remote spot, off the main roads. And wouldn't you know it, we stumbled upon this dirt track near Wind River Indian Reservation that seemed perfect. Thick pines towering above us, dappled light filtering through, a creek nearby. Picture postcard worthy, at least on the surface. We pulled in. And that was the beginning of everything. I like to explore, always have. Ari, on the other hand, he's content to kick back with a beer by the fire. So, I wandered the trees a bit that first afternoon, checking out our newly claimed camping territory. There was an eerily silent quality to the place. Maybe I was just hyper aware because we were so isolated. It nagged at the back of my mind, something I attributed to being used to more, well, people I guess. Anyway, I stumbled onto this weird scene, an old mining claim, like way, way old. There was even a partially collapsed mining shed, wood rotting, walls caving in. Probably would have moved on, but a bit of twisted metal stuck out, catching the fading light. Went through some scattered debris, rusty gears, old lantern glass, nothing exciting. The shed itself gave me the willies, so I made quick work of inspecting it. One wall creaked ominously as I stepped out, like it held its breath the whole time I was in there. Didn't linger to imagine whatever else might be lurking within. Back at camp, with a fire now dancing against the gathering dusk, Ari didn't miss a beat in teasing me about my mining obsession. It's kinda our shtick. He takes jabs, I don't bite back. The usual gonna strike it rich, are ya, Ethan? Type banter. Truth was, something seemed off with that mining claim something I couldn't put my finger on. Night fell thick and fast and we settled into our sleeping bags, more exhausted by the day's drive than I wanted to admit. We did some half-hearted chatting, but even in the dim glow I could see Ari nodding off. Sleep hit me fast too. Then, I woke up with a sense of dread that pricked every hair on my neck. I listened for a moment, and my heart leapt. Someone was moving around on the ground outside our RV, no whispers, just muffled footsteps, and then a chilling crunch and drag under the weight of a body. Ari was still out cold. I lay there paralyzed by fear. Could just be some curious animal raccoons get brave this far from towns, but a human-sized crunch? This place, the old claim, all of it just radiated bad vibes. I had to check. Creeping over to the RV window, I peered out, and my blood ran cold. A tall, gaunt figure stood a few yards away, wore worn work clothes and had stringy gray hair hanging from under a beat-up baseball cap obscuring most of his face. Saw what he dragged through the dirt. It was Ari. I choked back a scream. There was the glint of steel, a machete of some kind in the stranger's hand, moonlight playing on blood-stained metal. Ari wasn't just unconscious. He was dead. He'd never even woken up. There was nothing I could do but run. I burst out the other side of the RV and straight into the woods. I kept running, crashing through underbrush, dodging shadows, fear twisting me up inside. I heard nothing behind me, but I knew that figure was watching. He must have lived out here, some recluse turned killer. He knew those woods better than I ever could. His silence and knowledge gave him the ultimate advantage. I stumbled on for what felt like hours, but it was dark out there with just a sliver of a moon. Time melted away. The only reality was terror. Eventually, I came out near a road where a lucky trucker spotted me, dirty and wild-eyed. He took me to the nearest ranger station. 
Law enforcement found the RV, but no trace of Ari and no trace of his killer either. They talked about me as a trauma survivor. Some of them whispered I might have made up the whole thing. But that mine, the blood, they weren't imaginary. Even after years have passed, that primal dread creeps up during quiet nights. I always sleep with the lights on now and make sure I'm never too isolated. That guy is still out there, and some part of me believes he may never stop hunting. 